Good afternoon. This is Doug Loud standing in for David Mandy. And today O&M is happy to bring you Luminex Resources, which trades under the symbol LR on the TSXV and LUMIF on the OTC over the counter market. Uh, we wanna note that this event is brought to you by New York based O&M Partners. They are a marketing and communications company. We've been highlighting both online and offline up and coming stocks to the global investment community since 2002. We host several webinars a week of various sizes and formats on different companies and on germane issues with expert panels of seasoned buy side professionals asking insightful questions of management. We hope you will enjoy today's event and will want to participate in future topical and company specific events. Now, one thing we have to note is we want this call to answer all of your questions. And if you still have a question that isn't answered, please feel free to chat in your questions during the webinar to the question pane of the GoToWebinar screen, or just email us. Now, while we only have time to answer some of the questions, be reassured that your questions will be answered by management in a reasonable amount of time after the conclusion of this O&M Town Hall webinar. Today, we're gonna to have an introductory speaker, Paul Harris of the Mining Journal America's editor. Paul is a mining sector researcher, analyst, and reporter with over 16 years of experience in the mining sector and 13 years of experience in Latin America. Since 2015, Paul has been Latin American editor for the Mining Journal. Paul founded and edits the Columbia Gold Letter in 2011 that focuses on the gold and copper sectors of the Northern Andes and began the successful Columbia Gold Symposium in 2017. Now, just one thing, if you're receiving your audio through your telephone connection, please note you will not be able to hear this pre-recorded segment by Paul of the Town Hall webinar. Turn on your speakers to hear the talk by the company or simply wait the 10 minutes and then you'll be able to hear Luminex. Now I would like to introduce Marshall Koval. Hello, and, and thank you for having me on again. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about um, things to look out for in, in, in webinars. Um, O&M asked me to, to sort of talk about this, given that um, physical meetings aren't really possible at this time. And so I've put together some thoughts about um, things that uh, investors can look out for during these types of, of communication and engagement. Um, and really, this builds out of the things that you I typically look out for in, in corporate presentations, the corporate presentation deck, things of that to give an indication of um, possible red flags about a particular company, project or investment opportunity, um, things I, look, I really do look out for. Um, and I guess the first one to really um, draw attention to, um, this is a Webinars are a new way for people to communicate. And so I understand that companies, as well as investors, the audience, are still sort of getting to grips with things. But at the end of the day, it is still a professional communication. It is still a company looking to speak to investors, people that uh, it hopes will invest money in their company. And so I think it's always useful for uh, investors, and this is what I do, you always have to suspend human nature. Human nature typically expects people to be good, expects peace to be, people to be truthful, um, takes people at their word. In a potential investment situation or evaluating a company or project, that's not necessarily a very healthy thing to have. Um, and so, you know, to protect yourself, always su suspend that and, and question what you're being told, the information you're being given. Seek evidence and look for the, what supports that evidence. In the webinar scenario, again, um, I appreciate that this is new to a lot of executives as well. And so there, there may be nerves. Uh, they may uh, be a little bit flustered to be on, on camera or speaking to someone they perhaps cannot see. Um, but there are fundamental things that remain constant. You know, always like to see executives that uh, have a good grasp of the issues, have precision when talking about things, whether that's technical factors, market factors, 
government factors or social factors. I expect them to have a very, very good grasp of the facts and the situation surrounding their story. So the question there is, are they on top of everything? Can they answer questions uh, in relevant depth and detail, or are they vague? Are they always saying, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that? Um, to me, that if people that uh, are vague, that, that starts to look a bit shaky. Um, when you're looking at the, the slide deck, whether it's, um, you know, you've downloaded it from their web page or you're seeing slides on a, in a webinar or what have you, um, always look for how well produced that deck is. Um, the quality information is one thing and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but basic things, are there spelling errors? Are there geographical errors? Uh, has there been a lack of attention to detail? Um, other things that show that perhaps they've been sloppy. And the inference there is perhaps if they're sloppy in this, talking to an investor or someone they're looking to raise money from, what else are they gonna be sloppying? And often it's the, it's the lack of care and control of details that can be the difference between success and failure of a particular company or, or project. So a lack of attention to detail for me is never a good thing. Um, beyond that, a, a, a gold company, a gold miner is competing with you know, 200 other gold miners on the TSX. Exploration companies are competing with many, many more hundreds of companies. Beyond that, they're competing with every other company that's listed on the stock market. So how professional or homemade does their investor deck look? If you cannot communicate your story well and in an attractive way, in a way that engages people, um, a company I think is gonna struggle. And if they're gonna struggle, um, you know, is that where you wanna put your money? Regardless of how good the deposit is, if they can't tell their story well, they're not going to get the intention and probably the investment that they need to really deliver on that. Um, so does the presentation instill confidence in you or in me, uh, or does it create more questions than answers? Moving on to sort of my next slide of comments. Um, what are other things to look for? I'm, I'm not a technical expert, so, um, Things about geology and processing, I have to, um, to a certain extent, take with a grain of salt, but you can ask other people and there are other places you can check to uh, have a, a, you know, gauge how, how, how precise or reasonable or rational comments and things of the technical aspects sound. Um, but you also want to look for, you know, is there compelling evidence in the presentation that the company's been had successful engagement with government and communities. Um, I think to a large extent in this day and age, most technical aspects related to projects can be solved. There are solutions available. So more often than not, project success depends upon whether a company can get it permitted. And that means how well or not does it get on with government and communities. Um, again, assume nothing is going to be simple with governments or communities, even though co companies always say they have great government relations and great community relations. S look for evidence of that. Um, related to that, what are the timelines for permitting and, and permitting processes? What are the timelines on um, the economic studies? You want to know, you want a roadmap before you with several gate posts, which can be decision points, in entry points into stock, exit points for stock. Um, specifically, there will be news hooks for a stock. So how complete is the picture that you're being given? What's the team's experience in that particular country with that particular type of deposit? Things of that nature. Conflicts and issues will come up with governments and communities. How are they looking to address those? Moving on to the next slide. Um, timelines are very, very important. All investors, most investors invest with a, an investment timeline. Do you want to return in a, you know, six months, a year, three years, five years? Uh, that's very variable for exploration and development companies. And so you need to have a good idea of where you are on that timeline. Um, the Lausanne curve is a very helpful um, 
sort of thumb, thumbnail guide of that. And the Lasson curve basically shows the, the life cycle of a junior explorer through exploration, um, economic studies, permitting, et cetera, and into mining. And there are points on that curve where investor interest is high. There are points where investor interest is low. And so um, it helps indicate entry points and, and exit points. So whereabouts is a company on that uh, on that life cycle? It's always good to see a company have a a timeline in their presentation for you know the work that's to come, the various milestones ahead of them. Um, importantly, it gives you a means to interrogate the company in the future. You know, you said you're going to complete this study by this date what's happened, if it's late, why is it late, what, what's changed. So it gives you a, a means to um, see if the company is completing the work it says it's going to do, if it's having the success it says it's going to do, and you can uh, make your decisions accordingly. Um, that's particularly the case, I think, when it comes to sort of permitting. Permitting often takes longer than companies initially think, and it's also the case on, on mine construction, mine build. Mine constructions often take longer than companies initially put in. Um, that could be anywhere from three months to six months, and sometimes even longer. Moving on, um, one of the sort of final things um, I really look for in companies is transparency. Um, for me, that means in, in, a, in a webinar or conversation, it means not avoiding questions, not ducking questions, trying to give an answer, being very honest when, look, I don't have that information, but I'll get it to you, ensuring that they actually do get that information to you. And when things do happen, for example, the COVID-19 outbreak, um, being very honest and open about what is actually happening. They, look, we've had to shut this operation down because the government's mandated that, or look, some of our employees or contractors have contracted the virus. Here's what we're doing to, to mitigate that and to, to put things right. Uh, but equally, that applies in permitting processes, how they're going, how well they're going or not. And when incidents occur, whether that's the, the death of an employee through a mining accident or a community's protesting or, or, or whatever. Um, I think companies that are very transparent and open and, qu and quick to uh, share the information they have, that helps uh, generate trust. And at the end of the day, because I'm not a technical expert, expert generating trust I think is a, a, a key factor. And um, that's pretty much the, the, sort of look, the, the things I look for, whether it's in a corporate deck or in a webinar. Um, the webinar gives one an opportunity to, to see the company executive and to sort of get a feel, get a feel of the, the cut of their cloth. Um, and that's for me is an important indicator to um, how well that company may possibly do. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That was really helpful. Now I'd like to introduce Marshall Koval, the president and CEO of Luminex. Marshall has 40 years of corporate management, M&A, finance, mineral exploration, mine development, and operations experience, and has worked on mining projects in over 30 countries. Previously, he was a partner at Ross Beatty's Lumina Capital, CEO of Northern Peru Copper, vice president of development at Lumina Copper, and president, is now president of Colorado-based Pincock, Allen & Holt, a renowned consulting engineering firm in the mining and energy space. We should also note we have Scott Hicks, the vice president of corporate development and communications with us. Um, thank you for being with us today. Hi, Marshall. Hey, Doug, thanks uh, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. Just try to get this up and running here today. Got some technical issues, so bear with me. Um, yeah, real technical issues. Sorry about this. Huh. There we go. Um, I'm going to uh, be making some forward-looking statements today, but uh, I think I wanted to address a couple things that Paul was talking about, and I think I'll start uh, framing the discussion just to kind of bring you up to speed on uh, the COVID-19 situation 
uh, that we've been dealing with with Luminex. And basically, before the government set any restrictions in place in early March, um, we had two drill rigs going and we stopped the drilling voluntarily just to get ahead of the situation and, and put proper protocols in place. And as of last week, we're back to drilling again. So uh, we just have one shift drilling. We've had no COVID cases uh, in our camp. We have uh, pretty strict uh, transportation and entrance uh, protocols in place to deal with it. So we're starting back up. We're drilling uh, at our camp zone at the Soledad Bajo deposit right now with one drill rig drilling through the day shift and we're gonna start ramping up to a, a night shift as well. And I think I wanna frame the discussion on um, Luminex also in the context of where the gold price has been and, and where it's sort of headed. Um, obviously, you know, I think if you look back to 2011, uh, when gold hit $1,900 an ounce, at that time, between the, the Fed and the ECB, there was about $5.5 trillion worth of uh, money on the balance sheets or, or relief on the balance sheets. And today that's doubled. So I think we're in this gold price environment that we'll likely see over $2,000 an ounce gold by the end of uh, this year, early next year. Uh, today we're sitting at $1,710 gold. And I think one of the things I'd like to point out to you uh, with Luminex Resources is we have about 5 million ounces of gold uh, in our, indicated in uh, inferred resources at our Condor project. And if you look at that versus our market cap, that's about uh, $4 per ounce of gold in the ground. And if, we also have copper and silver as well. So if you look at it at a gold uh, equivalent basis, uh, it's uh, about five dollars and uh, or four dollars an ounce on equivalent basis five on a, a gold only basis so if you look at where we're at um, in the expiration cycle i think there's a lot of upside uh, as gold moves up uh, hopefully we'll see luminex move up strongly as well as we continue to put out new results so let me just run you through what our assets are in luminex we have three key assets uh, we have two world-class partners in bhp and anglo-american and all of our work is in Ecuador. So basically the uh, Condor project, we're operating ourselves. Uh, we had a resource estimate of 1.6 million ounces of indicated, 3.6 million ounces of inferred resources. And then recently we put out a new high grade uh, resource estimate of about 800,000 ounces of gold at our camp zone. So we're up to about 5 million ounces uh, all in at the project. Like I said, we're currently drilling. Uh, we're self-funding the work at the um, camp, camp zone project and in the Condor camp. And BHP and Anglo, between them, have about $100 million of work that they've spent or will spend between 2018 and 2025. So we've got a lot of good work going on these copper assets that are within Luminex uh, without additional spend from the company. BHP is our operator at our Tarkey project. They hope to be drilling later this year. They have to spend 42 million over six years to earn 60%, and they can earn an additional 10% by investing uh, $40 million, which basically would take you most of the way to a production decision. Um, Anglo-American, they have uh, 57.3 million over seven years. And Anglo is after uh, our Pegasus project, which is sort of a district scale play, whereas Tarkey is uh, two deposits that we've discovered to date within a smaller land package. The Pegasus land package is about 67,000 hectares, and they can earn an additional 10% by taking the project to, um, to a production decision. I'll, I'll give you a little bit more details on all of these projects as we move through the presentation. So this is another Lumina Group project. Uh, it's Ross Beatty founded Lumina Group back in sort of 2002, 2003. I joined him in 2004. Uh, Leo Hathaway, our, our senior geologist in the group, uh, joined in 2004. So a lot of the project team has been together through all of these companies. And you know we're an exploration development company. We add value, de-risk projects, 
and we move them on to somebody that would build the project. So several of these projects uh, have been sold. Uh, we, we raised 2.275 million and returned about 1.6 billion US to shareholders through the uh, Lumina story to date. Take a little bit of a look at uh, sort of where we're at. The uh, May 4th yesterday share price was 65 cents a share. We're at about the same level today. Um, we have a 52 week trading range. You can see it on the uh, screen here and you can see the chart how we've done. Uh, as far as ownership in the company, Ross owns 19.9% of the company and uh, Ecuadorian Entrepreneurial Group has 8.6. Route one, a fund out of California has 8.5. Management and the board has uh, 6.7. And then we have other US funds at about 6.2. So we have strong shareholder support and following. Market cap of the company is about 47 million today, Canadian. Ecuador has progressed quite a bit since we went into the country in 2013 timeframe. 2014, they engaged Wood McKenzie to help them with their fiscal regime and regulatory regime and made several changes to the mining code. If you fast forward to today, uh, some of the key things that have happened is the 2018 elimination of uh, windfall profit tax, uh, reduced the NSR range from 5 to 8% down to 3 to 8%. And two large-scale mines went into production at the end of uh, last quarter of 2019. Fruta del Norte uh, that uh, Lundin Gold has built and is operating, and Mirador, which is Tongling Mining. So this, uh, what's really kind of the takeaway here is Ecuador, you can permit and you can construct and finance mines. If you look at the case of the Lundin Gold project, from the time they acquired the project uh, in two, the end of 2014 in December till they commissioned it in 2015, they were able to acquire it, do a feasibility study, finance it, permit and build it in five years. And once the decision to move forward between the permitting and uh, commercial production was three and a half years. So you can permit and, uh, and build mines in Ecuador. Fruta or uh, Mirador was a little bit longer path. It's a quite large uh, project, 60,000 ton per day, copper gold, open pit, pretty similar to our Congrejos project in uh, Lumina Gold. Uh, Congrejos is more gold rich than Mirador. Mirador is more a traditional copper porphyry. So what's happened uh, between 2014 and currently is we have all the major copper players and, and several major mid-tier gold players in the country. We got BHP, Anglo, Newcrest, Fortescue, Dundee, Precious Metals, IM Gold, Southern Copper, Cadelco. So a lot of interest in, in Ecuador. And realistically, from a geologic perspective, I'm a geologist, um, Ecuador is the last systematically unexplored uh, jurisdiction within Latin America and probably the world. And it's created quite a bit of interest. Um, here you can see on this map, the different uh, projects in the country. You've got down in the uh, lower right hand corner down here, you've got uh, Mirador Fruta del Norte. That's in the same corridor as our Condor project, the most highly mineralized cor corridor of, uh, in the country that's known today. Uh, Tarki is just above Mirador, so you can see the uh, BHP's position there. Anglo and uh, the Pegasus concessions are here. You've got uh, Quito to the north and Cascabel north of there. And then our Congrejos project is over here on the, the other coast. So um, we have between uh, Lumina Gold and Luminex, we're the second largest concession holder in the country and uh, a lot of exploration potential within our project areas. We have several other projects that in blue here, Kimi, Escondida, Orquídeas, Cascas, Santa Elena, La Canela, Tres Picachos. Um, right now, management is working on our Condor project, which is here, and also on the, the Cascas project as our primary focus as we speak. So this is a zoom in into the uh, corridor that I was talking about earlier. Here is Tarki, Q, 
Kimmy is one of our concessions. We, we're doing a little bit of work there, but uh, mainly focusing on Costco and Condor right now. Here is uh, the Mirador mine just below Kimmy and uh, Fruta is below that. And then the Condor project is below that. And then we have uh, Sol Gold and some other players to the west. Um, if we look at the location, we're about 35 kilometers uh, south of Fruta, um, within the same trend, same mineralization. A lot of the mineralization at the Condor project mineralogically is very similar to the Fruta uh, project. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we had the, uh, the resources that we went through, 1.4 million, it indicated 2.5 million of inferred. And there's been some $40 million spent on the project prior to our involvement, about 120,000 uh, meters of drilling to date. And we've identified several, uh, several uh, targets within the um, Condor project, and we own 90% of the project. So the uh, red stars on this map on the right is the various deposits, and the table on the left shows the, uh, the resources that we have between uh, each of these red stars. The green stars are additional targets for exploration work um, that we are, are working on. Uh, so without going into all the details on these various tables, um, we, before the camp zone, we had uh, the 4 million ounces that I mentioned. Now with a higher grade camp zone, you can see there's 11.9 million tons at 2.26 uh, grams per ton gold. And that has about uh, 900,000 ounces. And, and that's a higher grade, um, part of it's near surface, but more likely an underground deposit. We're in the process right now of looking at um, the Northern area, the Los Cuyas Soledad Emma camp zone and trying to define a, a potential project there that we're looking if it makes sense to move to a PEA today. So uh, we're spending quite a bit of time looking at uh, the resources we have to date and if we can define a development project. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that in the future. So the interesting thing on the camp zone is um, if you look at the camp zone at uh, <laughs> There's silver within it and copper, lead, zinc. But if you look at it on a gold equivalent basis, there's roughly three grams per ton gold, and it gives us 1.1 million ounces of gold equivalent. You can see the sensitivity of it in the table below. And uh, let's move over to a long section of the deposit. We drilled about uh, 500 meters of a 1.1 kilometer long strike length. Anomaly in, in this cross section, you can see a lot of the mineralization is fairly close to surface, but it also extends about uh, 600 meters at depth. Here's some of uh, the core at the camp zone. You can see heavy sulfide. Um, this particular uh, core photo right here, we've got 52.4 grams per ton gold. Uh, this rhodochrosite vein breccia is very similar to what you see at Fruta del Norte. And a lot of the mineralization known to date is along these rhyolite dikes. And these rhyolite dikes provide the ground prep for fluids to move through. And when they're broken up, uh, along with the breccia zones on the margin, both the breccia zones and the rhyolite are mineralized. That's kind of the target we're looking at. If you look at here, it's a, a near vertical. These are the uh, rhyolites here. But you can see we have mineralization all the way from the surface down here. So pretty exciting uh, target for us. We're in the early days of figuring it out uh, geologically. On this map, you can see the camp zone up in this area, and it's on strike with the Soledad deposit where we have resources. Right now, currently, we're drilling in this Soledad Bajo area to test the extension between the camp zone and the Soledad deposit. So there's a lot of upside opportunity as well. You can see the Los Cuyas deposit. So Los Cuyas, Soledad, and Enma are all open pit targets. And the idea here is to potentially define a project or maybe you start at the camp zone, you can afford to build a mill, and then ultimately later in the mine life, bring in Los Cuyas and Soledad. We have another target area that um, 
is on trend there as well. Again, you can see the camp zone in the upper left-hand corner here, and it's the Prometador gold target through here. That's uh, where we plan to drill after we drill at Soledad. So a lot more drilling and upside potential for discovery at the Condor project in the northern epithermal area of the deposit. Over to uh, Anglo-American. So Anglo is working on Pegasus A and B. We kind of walk through um, their commitments, what they have to spend, et cetera. And it's interesting. They've done quite a bit of work over the last two years, and they've defined um, several areas here where they have potential copper anomalies. You can see them all here. The most prospective ones so far um, and their focus for their first drill target is this Medusa prospect. Show you a little bit about Medusa. So this is a cross-section based on geophysics, ZTEM, and, and magnetics. And what we look like here is we have a nice porphyry target with a halo over it, probably pyrite halo, which is typical of uh, porphyry systems. So they hope to be drilling at the end of the year uh, on this target. BHP, um, again, BHP is at the Tarki project, and Tarki has two concessions with two uh, discoveries in it. Tarki is our highest grade discovery we made. We had quite a few uh, outcrop rock chip samples and channel samples plus 1% copper. That's what interested BHP. BHP has done a lot of work, social, land access, uh, geophysics, both ZTEM and, and some ground geophysics and they plan to be drilling in the latter half of this year. Um, and then you can see that these Kimi and Tarki and Mirador uh, is in production now, as I mentioned. And these porphyry systems tend to, to form in clusters. So I think the thing with um, Luminex that's really interesting is if we can pull a development project out of the Condor project and BHP and um, Anglo have success at those projects that they're working on respectively. We're set up that we can spin these companies off into standalone entities. And this was the model for uh, Lumina Copper as we spawn off various companies as we advance them. So um, we're in good shape here. There's a lot of upside exposure to gold and copper in the Luminex story. And uh, you know we have a management team that's been there, done this before. We have the ability to finance, we have the ability to execute, and uh, we deliver on the guidance we give the market. So I'm gonna look a little bit more at Tarki. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the red and the uh, yellow dots are the high, um, so the round ones are the high uh, copper in soils and the diamond shaped dots, yellow and red, are high grade, plus a half a percent roughly uh, copper in uh, rocks. Now, Coscus, I talked about briefly. Coscus is really interesting. The, uh, this is a classic gold copper system. There's a gold anomaly adjacent in soils and rock chip and a big copper anomaly about five kilometers long. There was quite a bit of illegal uh, mining activity in the Placer area and the streams here. Um, we've been able to, th that, that has subsided. We've been able to go in and initiate some of the sampling work, a soil survey grid, which you can see here. Um, and uh, we uh, continue to work in the area, but with the COVID situation, we're at a reduced level, um, really backing off, waiting for the communities to get com comfortable with us to move forward and continue work, but highly perspective area. So reasons to invest in Luminex, um, you know, we have the new high grade discovery at the camp zone and the Condor project. We're dr continuing to drill it and we're doing engineering work. We've completed metallurgy, really good metallurgy for the camp zone, plus 90% kind of gold recoveries, high silver recoveries. Um, you know, we have about 5 million ounces of indicated and uh, inferred material. At the site, we have earn-in agreements with two tier one copper companies, Anglo and BHP. And uh, we currently uh, have another 25,000 hectares of land that uh, right now isn't the first priority, but we've done work and we'll continue to do work at Arquidius, uh, La Canela, Tres Picachos, Cascas, as we mentioned. 
a team with a consistent history of exploring, discovering, de-risking, and monetizing assets. And we have a highly aligned management team with Ross and, and management and the board owning 27% of the company. So that's, uh, that's the presentation. I appreciate your time. Uh, open for questions. That was really very interesting. Thank you, Marshall. Um, let me look at some of our panelists and see if they have any questions. Uh, Victor Zhao, do you have any questions today for Marshall? Oh, oh thank you. Um, so this area uh, looks like uh, should be uh, have lots of uh, artisan or mining. Uh, what, what what's the relationship with your activity? Is there any influence? Uh, your drilling program. So art artisanal mining, is that the question, Victor? Yes, yes. Yeah, up in the um, up in the the Condor project uh, in the northern part of the project up by an area called China Pinza and some of the area near Los Cuyas, um, we have uh, a illegal miner issue up there. It's a, a manageable issue. It's not a huge invasion. Uh, some of these guys have been uh, working in the area for quite a long time. Uh, we're able to, to work with them within the area. But the government has uh, come out in the last recent years, and they're really anti-illegal mining. And the government has come in and, and removed mining equipment and miners, not just in our area, but throughout the country. So. We'll continue to see um, the government uh, making moves in this regard, and, and the government is promoting responsible mining, and uh, that's a big push uh, for the government. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rolf Wagner, do you have any questions today? Nick Polidoros, do you have any questions today? Uh, Matt Geiger? Oh, Doug, easy day. Pardon? Yes. Yes, I'm here. An easy day. Can you guys hear me all right? This is Matt Geiger. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ex excellent. Uh, th thanks for the update, Marshall. Um, Couple Ecuador specific questions. Um, are you guys looking to stake uh, new ground? Um, and do you have any sense when the uh, long closed mining uh, cadastre will reopen? Yeah, I think what you have um, with the vice minister, Ben Alcazar, he has been in the press lately saying they want to open up the uh, concession system again this year. Right mm -hmm. now, that's not a focus of the government with the, uh, the coronavirus epidemic that's in uh, Ecuador. There has been um, fair areas that are fairly hard hit. Um, I think you've probably seen it in the news in Guayaquil in particular. Mm -hmm. Over in the Zamora Chinchipe area where we are with the camp zone, there hasn't been much in the way of coronavirus. There have been somewhere on the order of 50, 50 cases or thereabouts, and, and it seems to be growing a bit. But I think as far as opening up the cadastral system, um, we'll have to uh, see what happens uh, you know, with, with the coronavirus. Mining has been deemed an essential uh, industry, and we're able to move around in the country with safe passes that the government issues. That's how we've been able to mobilize drillers and staff to our project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe once all this settles down, I think maybe they'll they'll look at opening the cadastral. But right now, it's it's not a high priority for the government. And as far as us, obviously, um, we obtained a lot of these copper assets, the uh, the BHP, the the uh, Anglo American JVs we have through the concession system. So we would continue to look at uh, any concessions that seem to make sense to us. If you notice, when I had the map up, most of our concessions are in and around the Condor area. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to this map here. 
And uh, that's where we've tended to focus when we looked at these concessions where we're already established in the country with the exception of Pegasus, but that was highly prospective and we had data on it. So uh, that's that's what I can tell you. Excellent, that's, that's helpful. And a, a political question for you, the, the CREA administration has been very mining friendly on the federal level. Um, you know, you don't have to comment on this, but uh, there's widespread recognition that he hasn't done very well with coronavirus. And so he's almost certainly not gonna run in this upcoming election. Do you have a sense whether his candidate or his party's candidate would, would have a chance of winning and continue the, the pro-mining federal support? Or, or do you think his handling of the situation has kind of doomed his, his party for this upcoming election? Yeah, okay, so um, so Moreno is is the president. Correa was the, the earlier one. And Moreno has continued, you know, Correa was a guy in 2008 that basically shut down uh, the mining sector in Ecuador yep. and relied on oil. And when oil tanked um, sort of 2013-14, he realized he needed to reopen it. So Correa sort of started um, in 2013-14 reopening the sector. Moreno came into power and he continued and improved on uh, some of Correa's policies because he saw the need for uh, mining for foreign investment. And with this coronavirus situation, it's really made um, mining even more critical to the to the country. You've seen what's happened with WTI oil prices; they're they're down significantly. So, uh, really, for foreign investment and and Ecuador is a dollar-based economy, they really need the mining sector. So, I think the pro-mining sort of uh, message we're getting out of the government. There were a couple of referendums last year to try to shut down mining in, in regions, uh, primarily around Cuenca. Those were all shot down by the Constitutional Court. And I think the mere fact that uh, Fruta and um, Mirador were able to be built and commissioned, um, I think mining has got a bright future in Ecuador. So the next election is in February of next year. Moreno, back to your question, he's he's not going to run. He's a one-term uh, president. He sort of said that when he came into power. Bit of a transitional government from a hard-left populist to more center-left government. And out of his party, even though his approval rating is very low, it's down below 10 percent, um, what you have is a vice president that's fairly popular. And then also the ex-mayor of Guayaquil, Nabot, is a um, potential candidate. So I think regardless of who gets elected next year, you'll see a continuation of mining and improvements within the country for the mining sector, foreign investment. That was, that was very helpful. And yes, I, I misspoke, I apologize. I meant- uh, Yeah, no worries, no worries. All right, well, one more quick one for you. Um, Newcrest um, and the recent purchase of uh, Lending Gold's debt and, and the prepay from Blackstone and Orion, um, can, yep. can you speculate on on whether you think they'll ultimately end up owning 100% of Fruta del Norte and, and whether that would have any direct implications for Luminex at, at Condor? So um, if you look at uh, their combined equity position and, and the uh, facility that you just mentioned, you know, right now, uh, Newcrest has a little bit more than 50% of the fee free cash flow out of the Lundin Gold uh, Fruta del Norte project. So they're obviously, I think at some point, uh, likely to take it over 100%. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just my own opinion. I, I don't have any facts or basis other than what we just discussed to make that, but it seems like a logical step. And if you look at our um, land package here, uh, here's Fruta to the north of us. There's a JV between Newcrest and um, and Lundin, this green area to the south of us. We're right on trend, obviously, in a big picture sense in districts like this, you know, groups uh, like to consolidate properties. Um, obviously, that would be something we're interested in. That's I'm not saying that that's what they're interested in, but there is some logic for consolidation within the area. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the time, Marshall. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Um, 
Another question. Do you have any questions today, Donald Leon? Oh. Hello. Moving yeah. on. Uh, Thank you, ONM and Mr. Kobo. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, recently, Ecuador's bonds got downgraded by Fitch ratings to C. What are the foreign exchange implications for Luminex, and what is management's expectation for the next six months? So um, basically, since uh, Ecuador is a U.S. dollar-denominated uh, currency for the country, um, you know we raise money in Canadian dollars, and then we're pretty quick uh, when we do financing to convert our money into U.S. dollars. So we don't have uh, the currency risk um, in that regard. But it's a, a bit of a double-edged sword. What what it does for Ecuador, it doesn't allow them to float their own uh, currency to give them uh, advantages like some of their neighbors, uh, Colombia, uh, Brazil, you know, where you can float their currency and you know it makes operating costs within the country lower. So it's 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 both a plus and a minus uh, for Ecuador. I get that question answered. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next, um, Chesley Morton, do you have any questions today for Marshall? Yes, um, and uh, uh, again, I think it's a great presentation. Uh, I understand about the being dollar denominated, and so there's not a concern about currency controls or other things that might affect you a la Argentina. But um, thinking like um, um, some other models where countries have come under uh, a lot of financial pressure, and I assume that Ecuador is one of those who've suffered financially in the current events. Um, is there any talk about extraordinary perhaps temporary but extraordinary um, assessments against uh, uh, companies just to help shoulder that burden? We haven't seen anything like that. I, I think you're probably, um, if you look at the, from the bond perspective, you know, you've got uh, Ecuador downrated like was raised earlier and, and their, their bonds are, you know, a little bit better than Venezuela, et cetera. But you also have had the IMF come into the country and, and provide support. And the IDB um, is put uh, about $80 million into the country to help with the capacity building within the mining sector to get regulators uh, more educated related to mining. So there is some support. Um, you could have, I suppose, uh, a bond default. Um, and then you could also have the need for an IMF uh, bailout um, you know, further to what they've already put in place, the 4.2 million or so. But, you know, Scott's an Scott's a, a investment banker, former or reformed one. Scott, do you have anything to add to this from your perspective, from a, a banking finance perspective? Uh, no, I mean, I guess I would just say that on the, on the constitutional side, um, you, you know, mining and what the government gets is, is in the constitution. Um, so they would have to be, uh, you know, a wholesale change, and and it's not just something that you know could be done um, with an with the stroke of a pen, so to speak. Um, and then you know, also the existing mines that are in production have um, investment protection agreements. Um, so Ecuador would be opening themselves up to a a substantial amount of liability if they were to come in and change the rules on those. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Yep, thanks, Chesley. Um, that's our panelists for today. Does Scott Edmonds, do we have any um, writing yeah. questions? Yeah, we have a Marshall Barrel on the line. Marshall, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound good. Good. Hi, Marshall, from another Marshall. Hey, good Marshall. A, a couple of questions. Is uh, the, the Condor project, would that be an underground project? or the camp zone? Right, okay. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, the camp zone has, uh, it's likely the majority of it would be underground, but it does, if I get to these cross sections here, you can kind of see um, there's a lot of mineralization near the surface. Uh, a matter of fact, a lot of these structures outcrop at the surface directly under our camp. That's why it's called the camp zone. Um, you have the potential that maybe a bit of that could be taken in an open pit, but the project is likely an underground target. Okay. Uh, we'll, and be, um, we'll, we'll be releasing our um, our technical report uh, soon on the on the main resource there, and and that'll show some of the 3D figures. It'll it'll make it a little bit clear that you can see the uh, you know call it 500 meters of structure at depth. Yeah, it's sort of there's a lot better figures of this cross section here. <laughs> okay, and then. And you you just filed the PEA, so that's coming what within 45 days or a little less now. Yeah, it's to be filed. I think on May 15th. Okay, and then um, on the, the your two Ernian uh, uh, agreements with uh, Anglo and BHP, how much uh, what? <clears throat> What do they have to do drilling wise and or payments to Luminex for 2020 and 2021? Scott, I'll, I'll flip this one to you. Yeah, so Anglo has actually been spending um, a little bit faster than they need it to on the exploration side. Um, so they'll be, they're pretty close to hitting the $10 million mark, which is their first um, earning threshold at 25%. Um, once they hit that, they have to pay us an additional $800,000 US uh, over what they've paid us in cash payments already. And that locks in the... We lost Scott, that locks in the 25% ownership. 20. Uh, Hello, you, you, we lost you. Up. Um, threshold for them. So they've been at it for quite a while. Now, BHP had it for a little, little bit delayed uh, by the COVID stuff, um, but they'll be drilling fairly quick. So, you know, it, it, it's our expectation that if they if they were to hit there, they would uh, get to that first, uh, their first spending threshold fairly quickly. Okay, and I wasn't clear. You anticipate that you're going to probably be raising money later this year, assuming you're ramping up the drilling and uh, that, you know, there isn't some recurrence on, on COVID. Uh, how, how's the cash position relative to the expending? Yeah, so a lot of that will be driven, the burn rate will be driven by the drilling. Um, you know, we're we're pretty good into the end of the third quarter, possibly early fourth quarter um, with the, the drill program that we have planned now. But part of that will have to do with how quickly uh, we can ramp up. But uh, within uh, this year, at some point, we'll have to look at uh, going to the market, particularly if we elect to move forward with the PEA. Okay. Thank thank you very much. Appreciate the update. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, Marshall Barrel. I did want to just give um, Nick Polidoros one more chance. Nick, we show you as muted. Um, if you are there and, and still want to ask a question, you might have to unmute. Okay. I'm going to move on to some of the written in questions. The first one is... At the most recent Vancouver conference, Mr. Beatty suggested the likelihood of Luminex being sold in 2020 or 2021. Did I understand his comments correctly? Is this a strategic plan for management? I think uh, what Ross, Scott, you were at this conference, but I believe Ross was referring to Lumina Gold and, and not Luminex. Is that, that your understanding, Scott? Yeah, that's correct. Ross made a comment about uh, Lumina Gold being sold in 2020 and, and just for a broader um, 
broader context, the the creation of Luminex was was really to facilitate that. So that's why all the other Ecuadorian properties uh, were spun out into the company we're talking about today, versus Lumina Gold, which now just has the one project, uh, Congrejos. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, Marshall how how many how many dollars are you budgeting for 2020 each for Condor and Cascas? Scott, do you have those numbers off the top of your head? Um, for Cascas, I mean, we had originally planned a drill program of, I think it was, uh, I think it was just a, a couple thousand meters of scout drilling holes. Uh, um, you know, right now, uh, so people know, it's it's about uh, we're spending about two hundred and fifty dollars a meter um, on drilling costs. So, you know, a program like that could be done for for between a, a half million and a million dollars US, depend, you know, just an initial scout drilling program. Great, thank then, you. Next question. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the next question. Uh, what happened with first quantum minerals agreement? Is Luminex thinking to continue their results and ideas at the Arcadius? So at Arcadius, um, First Quantum drilled six holes in there. And basically we did hit some copper mineralization that was targeted, but they determined that the size and the scale of the project wouldn't meet their corporate objectives. So they moved away. Um, we drilled an additional hole and we had some copper and molybdenum mineralization. And so we have a, a understanding of what Arcadius is and our focus had shifted more towards uh, the Coscus deposit as being a higher potential uh, discovery. So uh, that's kind of where we shifted our focus. Thank you. Um, next one is, what is your relation to Lundin Gold and would you consider working together with them? So we don't have any formal business ties, although Ron Hochstein and myself have worked quite a bit together, primarily in furthering the Ecuadorian uh, mining sector, dealing with governments, uh, fighting some of these referendums, working with the Chamber of Mines in country to uh, communicate better what the value of mining is to the country, how to do it responsibly. So I, I talk to Ron you know, pretty frequently every week or two um, have a good working relationship. We share intelligence and information since we're operating in the same general area. But um, beyond that, there's no formal uh, sort of business arrangement. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question would be, in relation to Pegasus project, is it typical to find a sizable copper porphyry deposit nearby a VMS deposit, such as the 5% copper equivalent El Domo deposit? Yeah, I mean, you really got to look at the uh, the structural context within the area. So it's a really large land package at Pegasus, uh, 67,000 hectares, and, and we come up adjacent to uh, Curipampa deposit and, and El Domo that Aventus has. And uh, basically, you've got massive sulfides, you have scarn deposits, you have epithermal gold deposits in the area, and you have porphyry deposits. So, you know, if you, um, if you look at um, what, B, uh, what Anglo is looking at there, a lot of times when you get these porphyry systems, and I'm here on slide 16, they sort of appear in clusters. So the El Duomo and the... Uh, Curipamba is over sort of in this area here uh, to the left of our concession. So what we found is in the work that um, Anglo has done, obviously there's several porphyry clusters. And, um, you know, what Anglo is really looking for is these district scale, multiple porphyry systems, um, not just one deposit and one potential mine, but a whole district scale play. And you can see it has good potential for that. There's, I believe there's eight targets and you know, they're all gonna have a profile of some sort, but this Medusa target is, is the one they're most interested in to drill initially. Thank you. Uh, 
Another question is, will you be drilling the Promita door later this year? Yeah, we hope to. Um, so we're working that southeastern trend of uh, the camp zone towards Soledad Bajo and towards Prometador. We've built trails and drill pads into Prometador. It's a, it's a really steep area up on a, a steep side hill, but we've established uh, drill pads and, and access and we're continuing to work on it. So after Soledad Bajo, we would move up to um, Prometador and hopefully have some holes in, uh, you know, with it before the end of the year for sure. Great, and final question from the audience. Are you planning to spin out the Condor project into another listed company? So, yeah, the way we set up um, Luminex is we have uh, individual companies under the Luminex Canada umbrella. One of them is, is the Condor project. The other is the VHP Tarki. The other is uh, Anglo Pegasus, and we have a couple other companies as well. And they were all set up that you could individually, if you had success and made a discovery at Tarki, BHP makes a discovery, you can move that into its own vehicle. You could move uh, the um, Pegasus proper land position and company into its own vehicle. So that's the way we've set up the companies. That was the corporate structure for um, Lumina Copper and all the spin outs we did there. So, yeah, we would take that same approach, assuming we had success with the various projects. Well, thank you, Marshall. That's the questions from the audience. I think we'll turn it back over to you for some final comments. Yeah, so listen, I think uh, as we work through the COVID situation, obviously we've demonstrated that we can be responsible through this epidemic and We've pulled back, put good protocols health-wise, community-wise in place, and we've started back to drilling again at the Condor project. And our partners, both Anglo and BHP, are doing the same thing. So, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll we'll have drilling going at uh, with all three of these entities. Um, we're a company that's been together for quite a long time. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Ross, myself, Leo have all been together since 2004. Um, the same business model as Lumina Copper, add value, de-risk these projects and move them on towards production. We have a management team and team within Ecuador that, that has the ability to execute on the business plan. We've been there, we've done this before. We have the ability to uh, raise money and management uh, and uh, the board are highly aligned with shareholders. Um, so we're in the position to move forward. What I mentioned earlier about uh, Condor project alone uh, on a gold equivalent basis uh, being about $4, uh, $5 copper or $5 gold in the ground, uh, you can see that we're significantly undervalued. So I think uh, as the gold market moves up and we continue to have exploration success, you'll see uh, Luminex move up. And what we've seen from the gold market so far through this crisis is the major players, the, um, the barracks and the Newmonts that account for about 30% of the GDX. Um, those companies have moved up 40% the, this year. The GD and the overall GDX has moved up about 15%, but the GDXJ, the um, junior miners is about flat for the year that hasn't moved up. So what you're seeing in the gold market right now is the majors have moved up in response to uh, what's going on, both with uh, the virus and with fiscal uh, and monetary policy. You haven't seen the mid-tier producers move up as much and the mid-tier developers are even further behind. That would be the Lumina Gold and the junior explorers or, or the junior developers in Lumina Gold the junior explorers have barely moved. So I think there's some runway for, for the stock and uh, we look forward to putting out good results in the future. So that's, that's what I would close with. Great, thank you, Marshall. Uh, thank you very much and thank you, Scott. And also thank you, Doug. And we wanna thank everyone for being here today and we hope you have a great evening. Thanks everyone. All right, everybody, thanks for coming.